now, now you can disconnect and check out whether I'm audio because I'm now said I'm using the computer audio. Let me see. I'm connecting it to my. Should be. I'm audible. Okay. Can I start? How do you take attendance? Fine. So should I start? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So good morning, everybody. Uh, today we're going to talk about Nike uh, uh, arrhythmias. As you all know, heart has two important way of uh, getting palpitations. Palpitations means abnormal feeling of your heartbeat. There are two ways of going about it. One is that you can have increased heartbeat or you can have a decreased heartbeat. So we're going to talk about the increased heartbeat phenomenon. So let's talk about in general first, what is the basic conduction system of the heart? The conduction system of the heart starts from the SA node. So you have an impulse which gets stimulated in the SA node. Which is the AV node. In the AV node, it goes into the right and the left bundle. And from the left and the right bundle, it goes into the ventricular myocardium with the help of Purkinje fibers. At the same time, if anybody has a question, he can also interrupt and interrupt and ask me in between. That's not, that's not going to be an issue. So that you understand the basics of the, uh, the conduction system per se. So if you have a question, please go ahead and interrupt me. Am I audible? Hello? Am I clearly audible? Hello? Hello? Yeah, I'm clearly audible, now. Nah? Okay. Okay, I'll check the time. So you can see that this is the way the conduction system behaves. From the SA node, you reach the AV node. From the AV node, you reach the right and the left bundle. And from there, you reach the Purkinje fibers. So what are the basics? This is something you should absolutely understand. The SA node and the AV node, which are the driving cycles of conduction, are, activate, are slow conductors. And they're activated by the calcium channels. So calcium channel blockers like Rapamil, Dilsim, they have very good control on the SA and the AV node. While the other system, which is the atrium, the bundle of his and the ventricle cells are fast conducting system. And they're basically affected by the sodium channels. So this is basic you need to understand. SA node, AV node, better controlled by the calcium channel blockers because they're more calcium dependent system. While the, AV, the atrium, the bundle of his and the ventricles are fast conducting system, better controlled by the, by the sodium channels, okay. So this is a normal ECG. You all should understand a normal ECG. What does it have? It has a P wave, it has a QRS, and it has a T wave. What is important from V1 to V2, as we go from V1 to V6, your R wave becomes prominent more, and your S waves becomes less. At the same time, you always should remember that you have an AVR, which is negative normally, and you have a lead one, which is positive normally. So, the basic crux of heart is AVR negative, rest of the leads positive, and V1 to V6, you have an R wave which is increasing. So what are the mechanisms of arrhythmogenesis? You can have either an automaticity in the heart, you can have a triggered, you can have a triggered activity in the heart, you can have a re-entry in the heart. That means if you have a tachycardia which sets in, in the heart, it can set in because of what? Because of an automaticity present in the heart itself. It means something which triggers the heart. At a particular point. At the same time, you can have something like a re entry mechanism. That means this AV node, the SA node are connected by some other channel so that you have a re entry, means you have an extra channel besides the AV node so that you create a re entry in the heart itself. For you to remember, is important is either you can have an automaticity or you can have a re entry. That means focus, focal activation, or a re entry mechanism. That means a whole cycle. So what will be the presentation? The palpitations, because you have palpitations, you might have heart rate increasing so much that you are having a basic decrease in the blood supply to the brain itself. Because the heart rate increases too much, the diastolic filling time decreases too much, your cardiac output decreases per se. Sometimes for some 
anxious people, it can just be a chest pain. They'll be perceiving their palpitations as chest pain. Why can, how can this can be presenting symptoms? This can be presenting symptoms in patients who have a decreased cardiac reserve. Patients of mitral stenosis, you have a diastolic filling time decreasing even further. So your blood supply, your, your uh, diastolic filling time decreases, your left atrial pressure increases, and you have arrhythmia setting it even more. So th these are the ways in which you can have, for you at your level, the manifestation is mostly palpitations. Palpitations. But dyspnea, fainting, can be present. Sudden cardiac death can occur in patients where you have something like an R on T phenomena. Means these palpitations are starting on repolarization mechanisms. Uh, I would say this is a little complex thing for you. The basic thing for you to understand is palpitations, dizziness because of decreased blood supply, dyspnea, if there is coexisting illness, and faintness if their blood supply to the brain decreases. So what are the tools you need to diagnose once you have a patient with tachyarrhythmia? You can have an ECG. All of you must be knowing what's an ECG. Uh, or, or you can have a holter. You, a holter is something which uh, helps you to look at 24-hour ECG so that you are able to understand that uh, this is the mechanism which has occurred. Echocardiography is a basic structural heart disease you can identify. You can identify that there is a structural heart disease. So you are able to take care of the structural heart disease so that you can take care of your palpitations. An angiography or electrophysiological study is something which again helps us find out other causes of our palpitations. Basic for you is ECG and 24 hour hold. What is important in the rhythm is that you should take effectively, very importantly, look at the ECG, whether it's a wide complex or a narrow complex, what is the regularity? If you have any kind of pre-excitation, I'll explain you what is pre-excitation or ischemic changes. I, this is to find out from the ECG itself, do we have a subtle clue to presentation of our... Just hold for a second, just hold for a second. So this proper 12 lead ECG is also to make sure that you have placed your lead well. At the same time, you are able to identify any basal pathology which is present, which might be able to help us treat the diagnosis of the reason for palpitations. Even monitor means the holder itself, or it helps us to document arrhythmias over 24 to 48 hours. Now, what actually is this helping? Let's say a patient comes to you with palpitations, but uh, the ECG. Uh, when you take the ECG in the OPD, it's absolutely normal. But he says that he has episodic palpitations. So this monitor will help you monitor the palpitations over a period of 24 to 48 hours. So that you can even detect something which was subtly lying there and you're not able to detect because you have taken the ECG at the time when the episode is not there. So symptomatic, asymptomatic bradyar and arrhythmias can be documented over 24 to 48 hours. It also helps us to monitor our drug the most important arrhythmias which you have been talking about is the atrial fibrillation. So it helps us to monitor our drug therapy, whether we have been effective. The patient says, ki nahi, mere ko to asar hua nahi. but over a 24-hour interval, you are able to know that the drug therapy di, it was good enough, effective enough that he had some relief of his symptoms. Exercise testing, this is for your diagnosis on board. When the patient comes to you, you can know if the symptoms only appear or appear with exercise, this can occur if there is a structural heart disease or if there is a ischemic pathology which gets manifested by an exercise testing. Again, effectiveness of a therapy, you give a therapy to the patient and then redo the PMT testing and you are able to know that now the PC changes are not appearing. Electrophysiological testing is what we do in our cat labs. You place catheters in the RA, the his bundle, the right ventricle and the coronary sinus, and then you try to see the activation of the heart with each other. Because you see, an ECG will give you a gross feature. Like a PR interval, what does it reflect? A PR interval just reflects the activation from the atria to the ventricle. But you will not be able to, it includes the inter atrial communication, the AV load, as well as the his button. So this electrophysiological studies make sure that you are able to see the uh, the the activation from the right atrium to the haste from the haste to the ventricle. So where exactly is the problem? 
because in case of SVTs or PSVTs, you have a circuit. I told you re-entry circuits. So we'll be able to identify exactly where the circuit is acting with the help of electrophysiological testing. So it is much more specific. So what is tachyarrhythmias? The definition is anywhere where the heart rate goes above 100, you can have tachyarrhythmias. They can be sinus tachy, sinus bready. So let's go to each one of them. So sinus tachycardia means you have an ECG where the heart rate has gone above 100. Sinus tachycardia is basically a manifestation of sympathetic overactivity. It, its basic importance will depend upon what is the ego, what is the clinical setting, is the patient having CHF, is the patient having increased temperature, because in increased temperature, your sympathetic drive increases, you can have a sinus tachycardia. So sinus tachycardia is basically a physiological response, response of your body to some kind of stimuli where sympathetic overactivity is there, and you tend to correlate and treat the basic underlying cause. So this is an ECG which shows a sinus tachycardia. You can appreciate that you can have, that if you all of you know how to calculate the heart rate, what you need to do in heart rate is large squares, 300 divided by the large squares. Can you see there are two large squares? So 300 divided, it's a 150 heart rate. So sinus tachycardia means PQRS, very regular. You can appreciate a P, a QRS, and a T wave, and the rate is high. Sinus bradycardia, though basically doesn't come into tachyarrhythmia, they have just here kept it to just see, it will be the opposite. Your RR interval will increase, and you can see this in any person who has an increased vagal activity rather than the sympathetic. So athletes or during sleep where our vagal activity increases, you can have an RR interval which increases because your heart rate increases. So this is an example. You can see here, once again, PQRS is clearly visible, but here the large squares are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So 300 upon 7, so it, it is landing up to be heart rates of 40. Again, important to understand, it can be there as a physiological phenomena where your vagal activity is increased, or in sleep where your vagal activity has increased, and it's a it's a it's it's a, and a treatment will be according once again to whether your vagal activity has increased because of a of a physiological phenomena like sleep. Or it has increased because of something like a, a regular or irregular, or something like a physiological, a pathological phenomena where your parasympathetic activity increases per se. What is sinus arrhythmia? Now, this is a little variation in your heart rate because of a physiological phenomena in your body, which is inspiration or expiration. With inspiration or an expiration, your vagal tone changes, so you have a change. So this is what, what we should appreciate per se. Can you appreciate that there is an increase in heart rate followed by a decrease in heart rate? But this is absolutely, absolutely physiological. Fine. Now tachyarrhythmias. Now let's come to the basic topic. So, tachyarrhythmias are supraventricular tachyarrhythmias, atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, or ventricular. So you can be at the level of the atria, you can be at the level of the ventricle, or the intermediate connection. So supraventricular means at the level of atria, you can have a fibrillation, you can have a flutter, or ventricular means at the level of the ventricular, ventricular tachycardia, ventricular flutter. Okay. Uh, then now let's come to the atria. From atria, what can be the various responses? One can be a premature atrial contraction. I'll show you first. So what is happening here? See, you have a P wave which was normal, but you have a P wave there which the physio and I, the, the physiology of the P wave has changed. So here you have a P wave which was physiological P wave. Here you have a P wave which has changed its shape. So it has come a little early. So what happens with the P wave is you have a P wave which is different in morphology from the sinus P wave. You have a QRS which is normal. You have a, a compensatory pause. You see this compensatory pause? The pause which occurs because of PAC which is incomplete. That means this PP interval and this P wave which has come it will be a little less than the PV interval. Means it will not totally compensate for the PP interval. So what are the factors in uh, 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 the, uh, this uh, PSC? You will have a PSC which has a P wave which is a little different. You will have a compensatory pause which is incomplete. You have a P wave morphology which is a little different. different. What is multifocal atrial tachycardia? Again, again, P wave morphology is different. But your P wave morphology are more than three types of P wave. 
So you have a multifocal lateral tachycardia. Here you can see that you have P waves which are of different morphologies. They're changing. The P wave which is like this, the P wave which has changed its shape. So if you have more than three P waves in a different in a in a particular ECG, you can talk about P wave morphology. A bat. What is supraventricular atrial tachycardia? Supraventricular tachycardia means you have a P wave which has an appearance and a mechanism which is occurring above the ventricle, supraventricular. So try to understand this. You have an AV node which allows a re-entry. See, I told you there is another, another circuit present. So an AV node which allows a re-entry and you have a re-entry circuit. So you can have a, 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 a SVT because of a supraventricular tachycardia and atrial re-entry, atrial tachycardia, atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, which is acting at the level of the atria itself. And AV nodal re-entry, which is because of a circuit which is present in the AV node, which is extra. Or a ventricular tachycardia, which is a circuit in the ventricle itself. So if AV node is being used as a tachycardia, you will have a rate which is increased. You will not be able to appreciate the P waves because the AV node has another re-entry circuit. You will have, what you can do in this is, Increase the vagal tone so that the AV node conduction decreases and so that you are able to break the circuit. Or otherwise, you can give an AV nodal prolonging drug, AV nodal conduction prolonging drug like the adenosine. Now, this is a very classical example of Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. This is a pathway which is present. This is a node, an extra, extra AV node. That means besides the AV conduction, you have an extra node which conducts via the AV node and creates another circuit. So you can appreciate here, when you see the PR interval is so short, it is because instead of going from the normal AV mode, your PR interval has gone from the accessory pathway so that your PR becomes short, but your QRS becomes a little wide. So the ventricles received a partial signal partially through the accessory node, making sure that your PR interval decreases a little bit, but your QRS becomes long. Why? because this is no, a normal QRS activation. The ventricles are not activated by the AV node, but by a bypass tract. So the, the choice of drug in this case is that you tend to give a drug which tends to block the conduction through the uh, uh, bypass tract. If you try to block the AV node here, you will be increasing the conduction through the bypass tract, thereby aggravating your WPW situation. Now let's come to something known as a flutter. A flutter is where you have a P wave which is not well formed. You will have a P wave which is a sine tooth P wave, saw tooth P wave. And so what will happen is that there are a lot of P waves generated because the AV node has a particular capacity. So there are there will be a block at the level of the AV node. So you will see a saw tooth P wave. Some P waves getting conducted, some not get conducted, depending upon the conduction property of the AV node. And there, the treatment of most of them is either you control the AV node even further so that your ventricular rate is controlled or you cardioverted the patient. So this is an example of a uh, flutter. You see, you can't see a P wave per se. There are multiple P waves. You have P waves which are broken. So that means uh, that, you are, that you have a circuit which is broken, the circuit, which is present on multiple levels of the atria. Some are getting conducted, some are not getting conducted. So this is a flutter. So this a fibrillation is a manifestation of flutter itself where you can't appreciate the P wave at all. It is such a chaotic activity that some will get conducted, some will not get conducted. And the hallmark will be irregularly irregular. That means some P waves are getting, there are P waves that are formed, but you can't appreciate the P wave at all. You can't see the P wave at all. What you need to do in this case is that you will see the QRS coming, but absolutely at a preserved uh, uh, RR intervals, which will keep changing. So you are not able to appreciate uh, the, the QRS complex. It means you will be able to appreciate the QRS complex, but you can't appreciate the P wave. But the irregularity in the rhythm will be a basic sign uh, that, that, that there is an AF present. Now, this is one of the most common tachycardias. The way to distinguish this is you have an ECG, but the QRS intervals are coming at very, very bizarre and bizarre levels. Means you might have a QRS coming. They have no relation to each other. 
So the ATL rates are going above 400. The ventricle cannot, the AV node cannot tackle it. So there is a distinct thing. But there's a classical example. You can't appreciate any P wave. But what you can appreciate is that the RR interval is changing. You don't know where the RR interval is landing. So it's this is a very important picture because once you have an ATL which is very chaotic, so that you have an ATL which is predisposed to some kind of stasis because the ATL is not contracting well. So the stasis there, you're drawn to some kind of stroke. So these are the most important arrhythmias which will require some kind of anticoagulation to make sure that you don't get a stroke. So AF is a very big precursor for stroke. So its prevalence increases with age because atrial fibrosis increases. It's usually associated with structural heart disease. may occur even in a totally normal heart where you know that this is known as the lone air. What is important in this case, patient with AF is very, very important to see the ECG echo, make sure that the left atrium it does not have a clot, make sure there's no history of hypertension so that you are able to take care of the stroke risk with an atrial fibrillation. How do you manage it? There are two ways. One, you want to restore the sinusism. You want to make sure the patient goes into rhinocism. This is not always possible. Sometimes you can cardiovert them, but not always possible. The second way is that you make sure that at least the ventricle rate is controlled very well. Because once the ventricle rate is controlled very well, you at least don't have the symptoms and you can anticoagulate the patient and make sure that the stroke doesn't occur. Obviously, the advantage of a rhythm control is that you become normal. While the disadvantage is that you'll have to give antiarrhythmic drugs, which are also proarrhythmic because of the QT prolongation. At the same time, the advantage of a rate control approach is that you give simple drugs which control the rate, your rate is controlled, you're giving anticoagulation, your drug toxicities are less. So beta blockers, as you all must be knowing by this stage, are the most important drug which are used in this case to control the heart ventricle rate. You can use a combination of drugs if you have any doubt about any kind of irregularity of the heart rate and arrhythmia and, and other arrhythmia setting in because of rate, amiodron is the safest drug to give. If you have a cardioversion, which if you have a heart rate or AF which is persisting and is causing hemodynamic compromise, you have to give a cardioversion. But what are the rules of cardioversion? If the duration of the episode is uncertain and it is possibly more than 48 hours, then this atrial fibrillation might have created a thrombus in the left atrium. So you need to at least give anticoagulation for first three weeks and then plan a cardioversion till the time put them on an anticoagulation. And even after cardioversion, make sure that you give anticoagulation for four weeks. Now, if you're talking about cardioversion, uh, which has been, if you it is less than 48 hours, then you can be rest assured and give a DC cardioversion so that you can get to a cardio uh, 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 rhythm, which is a cardioverted rhythm within by, by just giving a cardioversion if it's less than 48 hours you'll have a chance of having a stroke what are the antithrombotic most devastating consequence of af is stroke which i've been telling you it tends to increase with age the most important thing is that you'll have to decrease the stroke with the help of anticoagulation and for that the the, the use of uh, uh, anticoagulants like warfarin and now no anticoagulants, no acts, which are known as non uh, oral anti the non vitamin K dependent anticoagulation is also available now. Before starting an anticoagulation, the most important thing to see is the Chad vascular. Now, this how does this Chad vascular? This helps us determine the chances of a thrombotic event occurring with the help of the previous history and as a particular scoring, a congestive heart failure, hypertension, age previous stroke, diabetes, or female sex. Now, how does it help? This is actually a modified score. With alpha score, you can know whether, how, and when to start your anticoagulation. Uh, so you have a score for each, the congestive heart failure has a score of one, hypertension has a score of one, age has a score of two, which is more than 75. Now, this score per se, as you calculate the chat vice, you will be able to know the risk score. For a zero, it is 1.9. For a maximum of six, it is 18.2. Very, very important. So depending on that, you can start your anticoagulation. So you can, if your score is zero, you can start with an aspirin. But the score is one, you can start with an aspirin or warfarin. And if the score is more than two, you can start 
with a mostly with a borsalin so here is pertinent to mention about novel oral anticoagulants which are uh, in the form of apixaban rubroxaban oral antenna inhibitors which can also be used now and they have been trialed head to head trials which is showing that they are as effective as the oral anticoagulants when you are talking about thrombotic risk you will also have to think about not just the thrombotic risk of the patient but the bleeding risk of the patient so there are this is known as the 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 tadvas score uh, the the hazlet score it helps us calculate the the risk of bleeding so you will have to actually balance between uh, the risk of coagulation and the risk of bleeding so as you are able to get to a middle where you are able to understand if the bleeding risk is very high you will have to be to practically keep yourself low and and think about uh, 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 increasing your anticoagulation because these two risk scores need to be balanced there are some common factors to the hazlet and the uh, the hazlet and the chadwas score which has the hypertension which has the elderly once again so this again has a score which is maximum possible nine once you see a patient with af you will have to balance these two scores remember uh, thromb thrombotic risk has a much more morbidity as compared to a bleeding risk so if you have both the scores high you will have to possibly think about from increasing the thrombotic risk but if you have the has blood score high and you know that the thrombotic risk is average by the scoring you can go ahead and make sure that you stay low on the anticoagulation okay and now so the key point will be rate control in a patient where you are just controlling the rate can be the primary therapy in patients who have a high risk of arrhythmia elderly minimum symptoms elderly don't want to go ahead and cardiovert them again again or give them anti arrhythmics proasmic so rate control can be acceptable option but rhythm control that means you want to make them normal should be the option in patients who are younger because they have a very long life to live first episode of af try to prevent the af further from occurring or who continue to be symptomatic despite for maximum rate control now let's go to ventricular tachycardia here we have been handling the atrial tachycardia atrial fibrillation being a very very important thing ventricular tachycardia is something which can be life threatening it can occur in patients who have structural heart disease where it can be ischemic or in totally idiopathic normal hearts where it is occurred because of automatic focus the important thing is that you will have heart rates reaching 100 to 200 p wave will not be seen the qrs will be bizarre and you will have more than three ventricular beats so this is the basically example of a ventricular tachycardia you see there is a bizarre qrs which is happening you can't see the p wave important sometimes in these patients is that you can appreciate some fusion beats in between when the ventricular tachycardia is occurring there can be a place where the ventricle got all the time in the swirl to to uh, communicate and there are some impulses which have been sent down so you are able to appreciate and and see one of the qrs complexes so what is the basic treatment if it is hemodynamic compromise straight away go for a dc cardioversion but if it says it you don't have the facility then cardron once again is the is the drug what is torsadi point is it's a type of bt only what happens in this is it's, it's the hallmark of this is that you can see dancing around the points you see in that bt there was a bt which was regular here you can have qrs which is going up and down from the point what happens in this you have deflections which are above and below the baseline what happens in a torsadi point is it's like twisting around about the point an r on t phenomena when you have a pvc a ventricular ectopic which occurs on the repolarization phenomena you have a precipitation of a of a tachycardia so drug that lengthen the qt interval electrolyte imbalances like hypokalemia hypomagnesemia can all lead to this type of bizarre qrs complexes and which is almost fatal if you don't give a your dc cardioversion if dc cardioversion doesn't help hypokalemia being a very important cause potassium and magnesium hypomagnesemia being a common cause have to be implemented remember this diagram should be very clear in your mind something which is twisting around the points going up and down both are actually torsadi points 
now ventricular tachycardia once again can be handled but if somebody gets into a ventricular fibrillation like the atrial fibrillation in atrial fibrillation you have the luxury that it's the atria which is fibrillating the ventricle is taking care of the qrs complex and the cardiac output you still can live but if this changes into a ventricular uh, what do you call as fibrillation this can be catastrophic because that would mean there is no cardiac output at all so you are not able to reach to a output a cardiac output reach leading to a cardiac arrest because if the heart ventricle is fibrillating it will fibrillate in a manner that the cardiac output becomes dull your output to the brain to the body decreases and thus that the person cannot survive until unless the person gets an immediate uh, a cpr with the defibrillation example of a classical example of fibrillation i want you all to focus on these things understand bt see the bt is regular though it is it is chaotic but it's regular the shape is almost the same while in a torse it's twisting around the point so going up down and and the, the bizarreness is much more while in a fibrillation you can't see the v wave at all it's like something is becoming straight a phenomena before an ace stone let's talk about treatment now you've gone from the atria uh uh you're talking about the atria you're talking about the ventricle you you're talking about atrial tachycardias which are not life threatening at least what they can do the atrial tachycardias they tend to precipitate and irritate your heart and the person per se but they don't cause uh, but they don't cause what do you call as uh, a, a life threatening thing they can be morbidity because of atrial fibrillation but they don't cause life threatening thing on the other hand if you go to something like the atrial ventricular fibrillation the same phenomena in ventricle will be life threatening and cause death now what are the basic laws of drugs i suppose you have finished with your pharmacology so you know the class 1 a b c 2 3 and 4 drugs remember important point is one class 1 drugs are acting basically at the sodium level sodium channel level so practically action potential from the very beginning so understand that these drugs will be very good in acting on the bundle of his atrium because these are fast acting channels as i say while the class 2 drugs which basically act on the sa will not because they act on the calcium channel more the class 4 drugs once again act on the calcium channel more so they are very good drugs for that phenomenon but if you see the class 3 drugs they act on the potassium channels so once again one and class 1 and class 3 drugs again both of them will be much better in fast acting channels while the 2 and the 4 drugs Will be more acting on the slow acting channel, which is the AV node and the SA node. Again, examples: class one A drugs are quinidine, tocilizumab, class one B, lidocaine, mexidine, and I forgot to add phenytoin. Class three is flecon and MK propionide. Now, why one A B C? This is because of the effect on the sodium channel. The class one A are medium acting sodium channel, are are a strong acting sodium channel blockers. While two B are moderately acting sodium channel blockers, one C are intermediate acting. So they have been divided depending on how how effective they are on blocking the sodium channels. Okay, and then we come to when in doubt. Let's say you are in the emergency as an intern. You have a doubt whether it's an SVT or not able to identify their bizarre complexes. It's an atrial flutter or an atrial fibrillation. The treatment of choice is cardrone, amiodarone. Amiodarone is one drug which is your Ramban. In case you are not able to understand what arrhythmia is going on, what is going up, what is going down, you can just give Cardron and take care of the phenomena. Because why this happens? Because Cardron, basically being a class three drug, also has a one B action on the sodium channel, and also have a has an alpha antagonism. So it is acting at multiple levels, taking care of the atrium, the ventricle, the AV node. After that, what are the indication of magnesium? Why I put magnesium is because atrial atrial arrhythmias don't kill, but ventricular arrhythmias kill. So what I need to to uh, emphasize once again is that since the ventricular arrhythmias kill, you need to have uh, uh, the, the the treatment for magnesium for ventricular arrhythmias which are much more. For magnesium is one of the treatments of torsade point is because hypomagnesemia. 
is a cause of torque repentance. Once again, patient who has a hypomagnesemia known will straight away go with it. In case there is an acute ischemia, you know the patient has an MI. In that case, magnesium can be given as a prophylactic phenomena per se because it is something which will take care of a life threatening disorder. Again, digoxin induced arrhythmia is a very good drug, but digoxin no longer used much. So, uh, for our at our level, at your level, antiarrhythmic drugs, depending upon whether you have uh, a ventricular arrhythmia which is present and you are able to identify whether it is an AV nodal abnormality, SA nodal abnormality, the best drug for you is Cardron. Again, as I said, it has all the properties. But if you have tachycardias, which are definitely very known, we are knowing that it's an SA nodal reentry, OV nodal reentry. In those cases, your C calcium channel blockers and beta blockers will act better. Thank you. I'll be most happy to answer all your queries. But please do come up with some queries. Are there any questions in the chat box? I'll just check. I can't see any questions in the chat box. Uh, if you have any questions in the chat box regarding the type of arrhythmias we have talked about, uh, I'll be more than happy to answer them. You can uh, type in your questions. These are important questions because you must understand the differences between atrial, ventricle, how to manage them in your emergency because some of them can be lethal, life threatening. So uh, I'll be most happy to answer them. You can just come up with the questions. Ah, tell me. Yeah. I'm just checking the chat. There is nothing in the chat or in the questions. Okay, I'll just check the question. Uh, I can see a very nice question. How do we balance between the CHADVAS score and the HAS blood score while giving anticoagulation? Excellent question. I think I'll need to go back. Need to go back and show you some. Very good question. Whoever has put up the question. I, I said this is the most important thing. The balance is individualistic balance. Absolutely individualistic. I told you if there is a if there is a patient who has both a high thrombotic risk as well as high bleeding risk, it is better to err on the thrombotic risk because thrombotic the morbidity is much more. But then, if you are able to calculate your uh, first thing is you'll have to calculate the Chadwell score, and the Chadwell score let's say is coming out high in this range. Let's say. In this range, sorry. 
the score is going high. So your stroke risk is available with a standardized chart with respect to your uh, the, the chart mass score. But the chart mass score has common things to the has blood score also, as I said. Now this is the has blood score, which has hypertension, abnormal liver. Uh, by the way, abnormal liver and liver and renal function means five times increase in SGOT, PT, and three times increase in the ALP. And for the liver, it's it's a creatinine more than two. So if you have this, which are both present in the patient, you will actually have to balance for an individual patient. Let's say the same thing is happening in an 80-year male. Your has blood is also high. Your cat blood is also high. Then you'll have to actually think about the bleeding risk score. It's an elderly patient. Yeah, the bleeding risk is the, 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 the chances of bleeding is much more. Let's say there's a 25-year male. Then you will have to focus more on the has blood score, on the chad mass score, because there it's the stroke risk which is much more compelling an indication. Because bleeding in a in a young might be tolerated, while a bleeding in an elderly might not be tolerated. So the balance has exactly to come with respect to individual patient and the score per se also. If your chad mass is somewhere like five, but your has blood is somewhere like two, you are on the side of the ischemia. But if it's the other way around, your chad mass is somewhere like three and your has blood is somewhere like nine, then you are on the side of bleeding. That means you tend to make sure that you tend to prevent the bleeding more. So the, it, is, it is not a standardized, you can't have a standardized, uh, what do you call, guideline. You cannot become slave to the guideline in this case. In this case, you will really need to have an individualistic approach. But yes, see the scores, compare the scores, see the age, see what the patient is actually uh, predisposed more towards with respect to his other comorbidities, especially the comorbidities with respect to what we call as 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 congestive heart failure, diabetes. These are a little bit subtle signs. Past history of stroke is a very good sign, very important sign. The stroke has been there. That means this person having a thrombotic stroke previously will have a very high risk again. So in this case, you will have to really go for the thrombosis mode, for the anti-thrombotic treatment mode. But these risks do help. These, these scores do help. But once again, remember, uh, individualistic approach will be important. You cannot become slave to an, an, a, a guideline in this case. I can't see any other question. Is there any other question? Any other question? You can kind of, this is a very good question. Whoever has written this question has tried to understand the topic very well. Good. I would like you all to understand once again the basics of what I started with. I, I think uh, atrial fibrillation is a very, very important topic, no doubt. But another important, very important topic is uh, understanding this. The tachyarrhythmia, supraventricular above the level, atrial fibrillation at the atrial level, flutter at the atrial level, and the same mechanism occurring at the ventricle level. So, so again, this chart becomes very important where you will have to understand atrial level. Atrial level means atrial tachycardia, atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter. AV nodal level, as I told you, supraventricular tachycardia or a both Parkinson White syndrome or a AV nodal reentry and ventricular level, which is integral tachycardia. Once again, SVT, that means it is at the node, or at the level of the node. And this is what I told you. This is something which you all should know Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. That is a bypass track which is present like this, a bypass track which is present. It is bypassing the AV node. See, this bypassing the AV node. So you are reaching the ventricle earlier because this pathway is faster, but because the activation is not in the similar, in a, in a normal pattern, your QRS becomes wider. So you have a property of, this is known as a delta wave actually, a delta wave, a delta wave which signifies the fact that you have activated the ventricles faster than the normal. 
and so what you have in this is that you will have ventricles receiving the signal ecg which shows a delta wave see this wave remember this wave forever a wave which is present on the upstroke of the qrs the pr is short your qrs is broader and you have a delta wave so this is a bypass tract so this thing is happening at the level of the av node so circuit again remember s atrial level atrial fibrillation atrial tachycardia atrial flutter av nodal level will parkinson white syndrome or a circuit in the av node ventricle level ventricular tachycardia very very important things to understand and examples i have kept simple examples so that you can see and appreciate what's going on the atrial fibrillation as you have at different levels of atrial fibrillation you cannot see the p wave at all you cannot appreciate the p wave at all you have chaotic but the rr keeps changing so this is the way for you to identify the rr will keep changing and how is it different from flutter you will have rr changing in flutter also but in a particular pattern a two is to one pattern means the irregularity of rr is the hallmark of fibrillation in a flutter also it might be there but there will certainly be some amount of some amount of uh, uh, what do you call uh, discipline maintained in the in the in the rhythm while a fibrillation will have no discipline at all and the same i wanted to emphasize about the ventricle also tachycardia there is a indiscipline but in a fibrillation the indiscipline will be much more or in a torsion deformity the fibrillation the indiscipline is much more you can't really appreciate what is happening it's like a class without a teacher any other questions please be open to ask them because these are things which can make a lot of difference to your practice if you are if you are practicing when you are in your opds this will make a lot of difference am i clearly audible uh, and uh, is there any other thing anybody wants to ask about again atrial level atrial tachycardia ventricular level ventricular tachycardia av nodal levels the uh, av nodal tachycardia the wolf parkinson white syndrome or the orthodromic orthodromic also can okay. i i'll explain you what i meant by the av nodal tachycardia the av nodal tachycardia i meant uh the that diagram itself is a very defining diagram in the meantime if you have any any other questions you can ask basically what i want to emphasize is that you should at least know this much once you crossing your mbbs again i said atria i think all of you understand atrial tachycardia atrial fibrillation flutter ventricle you are understanding ventricular tachycardia ventricular flutter the basic thing is at the level of the av node where i one thing i have told you the wolf parkinson white syndrome which means that there is an anti grade conduction on a pathway which has bypassed now at the same time understand this ecg uh, though a small one but understand this ecg wbw ecg very clear ecg uh, other ecg is this ecg understand now here there is a tachycardia it is totally regular there is no qrs which is widened but see there is no p wave which you can appreciate but it's totally regular so it cannot be a flutter where you have a short tooth p wave it cannot be a fibrillation where you have a clear cut uh, uh, irregularity it's regular so here the p wave is buried inside the qrs somewhere or in this whole system this is known as an av uh, reentry tachycardia see uh, wolf parkinson right could mean that you are going this is the av node you are going down from some pathway down and activating but there can also be an area where you are going down from the av node and coming back up from some pathway by uh, somewhere in the no, in the in the heart so these are known as bypass tracks so one is a bypass track which conducts anti gradely that means you are going down from the bypass track or it can be that you are going down from your normal av node but going back up from a bypass tract a reentry circuit that is known as a supraventricular tachycardia where you will not be able to see your p wave because the p wave is going back from another circuit coming from the av node but going back from another circuit this is when you have a grossly av node also and a circuit but let's say you have a circuit in the av node itself where it is going down from the av node and coming back from a circuit very close to the av node and that is known as a 
that is known as a AV nodal reentry circuit. That means I have mentioned two things here. When you see that I have mentioned two things here. One is an AV nodal reentry circuit, and one is a, 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 a non-AV nodal reentry circuit. Those known as the AV RT. That means you can have a circuit inside the uh, two things. You can have a circuit inside the AV node known as the AV nodal reentry. A very small circuit present here itself. Or you can have a circuit which is present outside from the AV node, a little far off, and there is a pathway. So that is known as an AV node reentry circuit. That means node is not a part of the circuit. The heart itself is having a reentry circuit. And that circuit itself, if it is conducting anti grade, is known as a Wolf Parkinson White circuit. So these are all reentries in the AV node itself. So we have atrial reentry, we have a ventricle reentry, and we have an AV nodal reentry in different forms. So might be a little difficult at your stage, but I think atrial tachycardia is not at all difficult. Atrial tachycardia, atrial fibrillation, not at all difficult at your stage. Ventricle tachycardia, ventricle fibrillation, not at all difficult. Might be difficult to appreciate the AV nodal circuits where you can just at your level remember there will be a R, there will be a P, they will be totally regular, and there will be a heart rate which is increased. You will not be able to appreciate the P wave, but the regularity will be there. So then it can be AV nodal reentry or AV atrial ventricle reentry. That means node is not a part of the circuit. But both of them will manifest in the form of regularity. Atrial tachycardia, fibrillation, flutter irregularities, but the ventricle will be regular. Atria will be irregular, but ventricle will be regular. That means ventricle, the ventricle will be formed well. You'll be able to appreciate the ventricular with the QRS, but they might be separated from each other at irregular intervals. While in a ventricular tachycardia, they will be separated by irregular intervals. The ventricular QRS will be irregular, and the QRS becoming totally bizarre in the ventricular fibrillation. Any other questions? And and I also wanted to ask, how do I get your attendance? How is it? How is going to send? I'll, I'll ask you. See, huh? Hello. Yeah, any other questions, man? But where are you there? I can't, I can't see them. And, and how do I get the attendance also? That's very important. Okay, uh, no, uh, you'll send it to me and I'll have to deposit it somewhere. Okay, as far as I can see, I can't see any of the questions. If you can see, you can, uh, you can, you. Okay, somebody is asked, can you explain EADs? Okay. So I should be using here. This is actually one. Very good. Yeah, there are many questions. Can you can you keep telling me the questions because I can't see them per se? Uh, uh, audible. How do I expand it? That's what I'm not able to do. Yeah, the arrows, I can see the arrows, but I can't see the question. It's getting so small. So, let me see. Very nice people are really listening. No. So, can you read out the question? I, I will answer it. Yeah, I yeah. read out the question. All of you can stay put because we. Okay, there is a question. Can you explain early after depolarization? Okay, fine. Early after depolarization, we'll go to that slide first. Uh, I didn't want to explain that because I thought it will be quite a heavy thing for you, but very good if you want to understand. So these are the mechanisms I started. Automaticity means something which is staying in there. Automaticity means it is happening at a particular focus. Triggered activity means the heart has a mechanism of action potential which is affected by either calcium or sodium. Early after deposition and late after depolarization are mechanisms where the QRS complex or the action potential is affected by the influx of calcium, either in the early phase or in the late phase, leading to an activation which is not normal, or in fact an activation which becomes very exaggerated. Fine. So it is it is something related to change in the action potential because of your calcium mechanics. Okay. Uh, okay, the question is, it is said that NOAC should be used in AF. 
Why is it so? Okay, fine. Very good. The important thing is NOAC has been able to differentiate, help us in all fronts, whether it's in all fronts of non volvular AF except volvular AF, and in volvular AF also severe AS, moderate to severe MS, sorry, not AS. This is because MS per se is considered to be a very, very pro thrombotic condition. Why? MS affects the mitral, mitral wall, which affects the left atrial appendage also, making sure that your mitral left atrial becomes sluggish. It is said that NOACs have been very good as an anticoagulation, where the effect, where the, where the anticoagulation level required is a uh, little mild. Once you leave, reach a level of mitral stenosis, where the, uh, the, the, the stasis becomes profound, the flashes become profound. Your, it is said that till date, NOAX in all trials have failed to balance the level of anticoagulation achieved by warfarin or the uh, oral anticoagulants. So, because the mitral stosis per se is a very, very poor coagulant state because it creates a stasis in the mitral in the left atrium and the left atrial appendix, till date, trials have failed to prove the efficacy, the equivalence efficacy of NOAX with respect to warfarin or the oral anticoagulants in patients with severe mitral stenosis. The trials have failed. So, so uh, right now, in those patients, still we'll have to persist with the oral anticoagulation. The novel oral anticoagulations could not be used. Okay. Uh, uh, I'll have to see whether there is any other question. Is it that now should be How to differentiate sinus tachycardia and PSVT on ECG? Very, very simple. Sinus tachycardia will always have a P wave preceding your QRS. A P wave preceding your QRS. While a, a, a PSVT will not have that P wave. I've just told you the P wave will be buried in the QRS. It will be retrograde because here the P wave is getting activated through different channels in the heart. If you can see a P wave with a QRS, P wave preceding a QRS, it is a, P a tyrus tachycardia. While a PSVT, the rates will also be much higher. A sinus tachycardia, uh, you say when you go beyond 100, but a sinus tachycardia, the AV node cannot sustain any tachycardia beyond 140. It will have a, after 140, it will have a refractive period reach. While a PSVT, your heart rates will be going to 200. You will not be able to see the P wave. You will be seeing the QRS, but the P wave will be buried because there is another pathway which is conducting the QRS. Differentiate of win two or in an ECG with rapid heart rate. How do we differentiate the wave with two or complexes in a P or a T? Very good. Once again, very good man. Uh, again, see, and when you have the sinus, a sinus system will have a P or a QRS. Uh, and a T wave. The P wave is a much sharper wave. So a T wave will consistent wave will be appreciate when the patient goes into tachycardia. The way to differentiate will be that you will have to have a visual impression of the P and the Q T wave in the sinus system. Once you have that visual impression very clear, once you have the patient to a tachycardia, you'll be able to appreciate that the wave which you are seeing in the tachycardia is it resembling the P wave or the T wave. So the differentiation has to come from the sinus rhythm, easy which should be available with you, you want to differentiate well. Any other questions? Let me ask your chat box. Nothing in the chat box. Let me ask your CR once again. Have any other questions? Yeah, uh, any other questions? Okay, very good. Types of cardioversion. Okay, I'll just answer that. So there are two things you should know about cardioversion. Uh, there is known as a defibrillation and a cardioversion. Once you have a regular tachycardia like a VT, 
you would like to uh, different you would like to uh, uh, convert it with a dc card to virtual here you 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 know that you are all must have seen the dc card virtual happening in front of you you have a synchronized shock or a synchronized shock a synchronized shock means you are synchronizing with the r wave so in that case when you give a shock you are synchronizing the r wave that's known as a cardio version cardio version once you are having a bizarre complex that means the qrs which is totally irregular like a fibrillating wave then you don't have time for synchronizing you just want to give a shock that's known as a defibrillation so if your shock is synchronized that's known as a cardio version once your shock is not synchronized with the r wave that is known as a defibrillation uh now also the shock you should know previously the dc uh, shocks which used to be given by machines used to be uh, uh, known as a unipolar now we have bipolar shocks so the bipolar shock is little little thing which you might not you should I'll try to explain it bipolar shock means previously the shock used to have a single vector let's say a se b jana hai a se b jaye shock dikha gaya agar hum shock ko aate nahi a se b jaye bas